All right. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, for having me back. It's great to be back in Utah. Uh, great snow and great papers. All right. So I'm, so I'm going to talk about this paper by Peter and Chiguo on leverage dynamics without commitment. All right. So, so the paper is a two of the force. There's uh, more results than Chiguo can possibly uh, cover in 30 minutes uh, or that I can discuss. So I'm going to not do too much inside baseball, but I'll, I'll try to break it down and, and add some comments. So um, essentially, what's the, this is, the, the paper has uh, leverage dynamics in, in a model where firms cannot commit to future debt policy. It's a Leland type model, and there's continuous adjustment, unlike in much of the literature, continuous adjustment of uh, how much debt you're issuing uh, without commitment. Uh, and then there's rich implications for leverage uh, and a maturity choice and a bunch of things. Highlights. There's a leverage ratchet effect, which essentially means that you keep issuing more debt, okay? uh, which builds on uh, some of uh, Peter's previous work. Uh, there's, here, there's the extra aspect that's happening here is that ma debt matures at a certain rate, and there's cash flow growth. Both of these two effects allow the leverage to at times decrease, and that means that in the eventually leverage is actually stable. All right? um, the, the, the extra uh, insights are bankruptcy uh, costs are fully uh, dissipated by tax uh, uh, benefits, and uh, the firm is actually indifferent about the maturity structure. So uh, let me just briefly outline what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a brief history of uh, 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 economic thought and capital structure. Then I want to talk about the paper. Then I want to uh, uh, tell you a, a couple of things about stylized facts, and then finally about what determines the capital structure. Um, okay, so brief history of uh, uh, thought on uh, uh, capital structure. Uh, generation one, uh, Modigliani Miller doesn't matter. Okay, generation two, um, there's debt and there's equity, and it does matter. Why is there debt and equity? Because I said so by assumption. It's exogenous. Okay, we are not going to explain why is there debt and equity. It's just how it is. Deal with it. Okay. Uh, two sets of two classes of models, if you want. There's trade-offs. Well, maybe there's there's even actually Modigliani Miller hinted at well, maybe taxes could make a difference. And then there's a, a, the trade-off uh, literature, which essentially backs that uh, there's a, a tax advantages and and some bankruptcy costs. And then a, 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 a of course a, a several noted papers on uh, well, maybe it affects investments, uh, incentives, or information, and so on. Generation three is contracting models, okay? At times known as security design. Uh, here, the, what is the key difference? I didn't tell you that there's debt and equity. Uh, their claims are endogenous. Uh, essentially, two key frictions. Either a model has a private information, that's where uh, uh, Peter and Jiguo have uh, contributed a lot, uh, or uh, limited enforcement, limited commitment. Uh, that's where I happen to have, uh, 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 that's an environment I have happened to have thought about. Now, importantly, here, lim this is limited commitment in a very different way. Here, I can commit to deliver my promises. Very different from here, where I can commit to uh, my future debt policy. So, where's the Marzo Hey? It's a, a trade off. Now, it has a lot of incentives. Actually, Shigo uh, didn't talk much about debt overhang, but there's a lot of these aspects that are there. Um, but it's essentially like uh, uh, doing this now, uh, uh, but in a beautiful way. All right. So what's the model setup? So, so here's, here's the setup. Uh, continuous time, risk neutral. I, I'm gonna, I've simplified it just a little bit. So it's a, a geometric pattern in motion. Uh, uh, you have that, that uh, uh, matures uh, at, the, uh, at some rate uh, xi. And we are going to look at smooth equilibria where I issue at a certain rate gt. Okay? Why is that that? Because I can save on taxes. Okay? So firms borrow to save on taxes. And what happens if you uh, default? If you default, the project stops and everything is lost. Okay? Uh, again, this can be extended, but, but that's what, what, what we do. What's nice about this is the only effect of that is that there's indirect delusion uh, of, of the debt which because it accelerates default. All right. Um, so now, what happens, we, have a, uh, we get the HJB equation for the value of uh, the firm. And so here's the uh, after tax uh, net cash flows. We have to repay the debt. Uh, these are the dynamics of the state variable. The key here is only this red term is really issued by, determined by the issuance policy, G. 
and notice that the red term is in fact linear in G. So when I issue more, I get the price of what I issue. Uh, but of course, then tomorrow I wake up with more debt. All right. And so first of all, the condition says this need, uh, price needs to exactly equal minus the, this utility, if you want, of having more debt tomorrow. Um, now, that turns out to be useful um, uh, because uh, that's where the, the, the key trick of, um, uh, of the paper comes in. All right, the key trick comes in uh, because uh, the, these two terms equal to zero. Actually, the G drops out of the HJB. So, so check it. This is the HJB, but in fact, it reduces to this. OK, what's nice, do you see G? No, no longer there. So I can actually, and this is the magical uh, thing here, uh, I can actually solve this, and I can assume that I can solve it as if G were 0, OK? Which means I can determine the price of the equity without figuring out. Uh, importantly, why was this so important? Well, because importantly, that price is gone, which is this forward-looking object, which is very hard to solve. OK, so this is the uh, genius of this. The, the, there's some discussion of what the intuition is. Frankly, I, I would like to see more here. Uh, I'm still, it, it's alluded to, yes, it seems a little like Cosian dynamics, but why exactly is it that the entire that tax advantage is dissipated in this? Frankly, I don't understand. So, so I would like to see more on this. Um, then, of course, you have to go on. You have to compute the uh, first order condition uh, using the first order condition in the HJB. For the debt, you have to figure out what is the price of debt so it's consistent with equilibrium, and finally figure out what the issuance policy is. Okay? Then again, I called it a tour de force. There's a bunch of different things that you can learn from this. The leverage ratchet effect, you always issue more debt. It doesn't mean that the debt now always goes up because it matures at a certain rate and the cash flow goes up. So relative to cash flows, at least it doesn't always go up and, and because of maturity. Um, there's a bunch of things that, that, that uh, one thing that's interesting is actually if you think about just the choice of maturity going forward, the firm doesn't care. Why does it care? Essentially because of the same trick, because you can think of it as you can solve for the value of equity even if there's no future debt issuance, and so then it doesn't, obviously doesn't matter what the maturity is. Um, so, so that's nice. There's a bunch of different things that, 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 that I could highlight. One I want to highlight, which Shigo didn't really talk about, uh, uh, but it's a bit awkward because, uh, so what happens here is, suppose, so we've assumed mostly that there's no recovery value, but suppose there is recovery value. Here's what happens. Actually what happens is if there's recovery value, it reduces leverage. Why? It goes like this. Suppose there's recovery value and it's the eve of bankruptcy, okay? So in the next instant, you're going to default. What are you going to do? You're going to issue a, 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 an infinite amount of debt if you want, what are the new debt holders going to pay you for it? Exactly the liquidation value. Where are you going to put it? In your pocket. What do the other debt holders get? Nothing. And so essentially, the, the, val the liquidation value ends up in the pockets of the equity holders because on the eve of bankruptcy, they dilute everybody uh, pre-existing. Now, that, that means that that would actually uh, re be lower uh, the more recoverable assets are. And I'll talk about that. All right. So uh, uh, it, there's much more in the paper, and again, uh, uh, I don't have, uh, Shiguo didn't have time, and I don't have the time to touch on everything, but I want to do something else instead. In fact, I want to talk about, about facts, okay? So, uh, uh, so leverage, every, what are the stylus facts? So in fact, I discussed the previous paper uh, uh, by Peter and, and his co-authors, and uh, one of the points I made is, I said, can the ratchet effects uh, leverage uh, basic facts about leverage dynamics? Uh, at the time, I just uh, threw this out there. Well, I was a discussant. This time, I did my homework. Okay? So what did I do? I, 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 I plot. A, 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 so this is a, a crisp CompuStat, 1965 to 2010, a market leverage. Uh, it's a bin scatter. I'm a theorist, so this is uh, uh, exotic to me. Um, uh, and so uh, there, this is by crisp age. Okay? And so what is the pattern in leverage uh, by firm age? Uh, you see, there's a little bit of an increase here, actually. But it's, it's relatively flat, OK? So then, uh, um, just uh, uh, to uh, 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 think about this a little bit more, so, so what are the determinants of capital structure? Well, uh, some people argue uh, that there is one that is first order uh, and, and is collateral. In fact, Peter, Peter's presidential address was sort of actually talking about collateral and capital structure and, and, and uh, thinking about this. Uh, 
a, a vision in, a, in, a, uh, in our 2013 paper called Collateral and Capital Structure. Uh, the first sentence of that paper reads, we argue that collateral determines the capital structure. Okay? Uh, uh, so what do we mean by this? When you plot market leverage now against uh, uh, tangibility, uh, leverage varies by a factor of about four. Okay, so now go back to uh, leverage retrograde effect. Uh, we haven't controlled for tangibility. Let me just do one thing, control for tangibility. Uh, and it, it's pretty much flat, actually. And then again, I had no idea what that would turn out here, but it, it seems like remarkably flat. Um, by the way, I threw in fixed effect. For fixed effects, it, it looks exactly the same, the picture. Um, so then uh, you might ask, OK, so maybe within tangibility bins, uh, there's a pattern. Uh, and that's an interesting question. So I made uh, uh, deciles by tangibility and looked at the leverage over time. Uh, uh, you can, I, this is not just survivors, but you can do it through survivors. You get the same thing. Essentially, still pretty flat. Now, down here, of course, there's a little bit of a pattern. So for the low tangibility firms, it seems that they actually uh, uh, increase their leverage over time. By the way, just to be clear, the model says kind of that eventually things are stationary, uh, but there's quite a bit of emphasis on this like early on uh, leverage uh, uh, increasing. And, and, so, so, and you see it a little bit here, but then of course, any good student of the capital structure knows that if you want to understand the capital structure, you gotta adjust for leasing, okay? So do the very same thing, but now adjust capital structure for leased capital, it's the very same thing, except now I have least adjusted leverage and least adjusted tangibility sorted in te into decile, uh, decile uh, I guess in, in, in asset pricing we would call it uh, uh, portfolios, but they're uh, uh, just uh, bins. And what you see is it's, it's remarkably flat, actually, uh, uh, and, and which, which I, I found surprising. Um, OK, so this is just the reason. Why, OK, so uh, this is uh, um, uh, about my own work, but I'm supposed to discuss uh, uh, Peter and Shigwa's work, so moving on. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so leverage. So, so, so one thing uh, that is stressed in the paper is that leverage is uh, 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 Michael and, and co-authors have argued that leverage is largely time invariant and is, is largely unexplained. Uh, just to, uh, 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 this is again my picture of before for market leverage and tangibility. Uh, what, what I did is I said like, okay, so throw in firm fixed effects, which is kind of doing more than, 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 than Michael does, so you, but it looks the same, the picture, if you have initial leverage. It's, what of course happens is the within variation in, in, in tangibility is now less. However, the pattern is exactly the same. And again, the, uh, leverage varies by factor four. Uh, if you have pooled data, it still varies per factor three with tangibility if you have, um, uh, if you have um, uh, just within uh, variation. All right. Um, so uh, next, I, I want to, so it's also, so she actually didn't talk about this. But he, he, the, the paper also argues, well, maybe, we, maybe this is at the heart of zero leverage puzzle, uh, uh, of the zero leverage puzzle. So I thought, uh, let's look at zero leverage, by the way, defined as leverage of 5% um, or less. Here's the pattern by age. These are uh, a, a zero leverage by age. And actually, there is some pattern uh, a, a, a by age uh, a, a, that, that is interesting. Now, uh, of course, again, uh, I argue you would, you would want to control, uh, you want to adjust for leasing here too. Uh, then uh, I'm not sure there is a much of a, lease, uh, of a zero leverage puzzle, um, and, and, but it is, uh, and it's still certainly the case that the very uh, young firms have less leverage. Okay? Um, uh, by the way, just, uh, I, of course, like in, 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 in uh, almost over time, uh, I'll, I'll uh, as, uh, just make one point. I, I don't think the zero leverage puzzle is really a puzzle. Uh, here's zero leverage by tangibility. Uh, so who, who doesn't borrow? Firms that don't have tangible assets. Uh, and then once you lease adjust, uh, uh, everybody has uh, more than 5% leverage, uh, uh, except the people who neither uh, lease nor own tangible assets. Okay? So, but uh, to come back uh, uh, to the issue at hand. So this is an artful model. Uh, of leverage dynamics without commitment. It's building on classics, uh, including Le uh, Leland's papers. Uh, it's kind of an instant classic. It takes this like, it's, 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 it's something you want to know. You want to know what exactly happens if you do it, like if you have, if, if, what is this continuous time limit of I can continuously dilute you, 
Okay? And, and it has rich dynamics, many clever uh, and, and some surprising insights, uh, some that I would want to understand better. Um, in terms of what explains leverage dynamics, I think that many basic patterns in, in leverage can be understood uh, uh, from the vantage point of collateral. So I think collateral should be center stage of any model of capital structure. Uh, uh, I think Peter sort of uh, argued this in his presidential address. We've argued this previously. But I do think that it's very interesting to think about what additional status facts does this uh, leverage policy without commitment uh, uh, help us explain uh, uh, beyond this. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing more on this.